G'day everyone, it's Matt and welcome to another podcast. It's Adelaide Grand Prix Part 2. Once again, I sat down with Adrian and we discussed some of the memorable moments from the Adelaide Grand Prix. The plan was to also discuss whether the Grand Prix was stolen, but we ran out of time. We just got so caught up, there was so much to talk about. How we lost the Grand Prix will be coming up in Part 3. Sit back, relax. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Alrighty, so here we are down in Rummel Park, just sitting by the lake watching the ducks go by. Just had some wedges and soft drink at the Stag Hotel on the corner of East Terrace and Rundle Road. Had a nice view of the uh, the Adelaide Grand Prix circuit there. We looked uh, right down uh, East Terrace towards banana bend and then we could see all the way down rundle road towards the old kent town brewery uh, where the malt towers used to be and uh, that's now turned into the brewery apartments i'm here again with uh, adrian we're going to chat about the adelaide grand prix doing part two i'm just going to discuss some of the big moments during the years and also talk about whether the adelaide grand prix was lost stolen or whether we all just fell asleep at the wheel adrian thanks for joining me Thank you, and yeah, probably all three. <laughs> um, in the last podcast, we spoke about there only being two championship deciders in Adelaide. However, Adelaide did have a lot of uh, memorable moments, so we will cover some of those off today. Just quickly, did you watch the uh, Imola Grand Prix on the weekend? Yeah, absolutely. It was great to see those, you know, one of those old school tracks, um, especially one that was, you know, around in the Adelaide era. That was actually um, on the calendar every year that Adelaide was on. So it's a nice sort of correlation and it's not changed too much from, you know, post um, Senna's death, they changed the track a bit, but it sort of looks pretty much the same as it was in the late 90s. So, yeah, it's great to see those tracks still get a run on the calendar. You did mention about Senna's death and that was uh, sadly in 1994 and a horrific weekend um in Imola in 94, we had uh, Barrichello on the Friday, had, had his massive accident, 95 Gs into the barrier, um, knocked unconscious, thankfully survived. Saturday, Roland Ratzenberger passed away, so it was already a bad weekend, and then we lost Then we lost Senna um, on, the, on the Sunday, 1994, towards the end of the Adelaide Grand Prix era, but Senna played a really, really big role, didn't he, in the Adelaide Grand Prix era? He started off in 1984 with Tolman and then went to JPS Lotus in 1985. Yeah, I think if you were to pick one driver that really defines the Adelaide era, it is Senna. Um, So Adelaide comes onto the calendar in 85, the same year where he wins a Grand Prix for the first time and he becomes this sort of the next big thing and he really establishes himself as probably outright the quickest driver and you know he's there throughout and then come 94 you know you you know with his loss it's also the first year when Adelaide knows it's going to lose the Grand Prix and sort of we host the 94 race knowing that it's all coming to an end so it's sort of this massive double whammy where it's the end of an era on multiple fronts. So as a set of absolutely on the limit into the apex, getting the line through the corner, making the corner, smoothing it out as best he can, just clipping the curb there on the inside and then sliding it out to the exit, riding up the curb. And this is, oh, this is sensational. And I have to say, I don't think anybody's going to beat that. If I had to put money on it, I'd say that won't be beaten today. The drivers are basically sitting in a car with a, with a bomb in the back when they especially during qualifying they had the qualifying tires qualifying gearboxes qualifying turbos that lotus pushed out reportedly over 1100 horsepower and qualifying trim they were pretty crazy days weren't they and they're really mavericks on track as well absolutely if you watch that 85 lap from center on youtube it the car just looks out of control you know he's skating through the corners and then it's just this sort of turbo boost down the straights and it, it's um, famously it's in the center movie that they, they show an extended version of uh, you know extended footage of that lap and you just go that just shows his skill and you think that was in his the end of his second season and um it, it really was amazing we we uh, in adelaide was very lucky in the sense that it married up with this golden era of formula one your know, center turbo engines you know um just the, the incredible excitement around it and you know what a way to start you know your first the first grand prix in adelaide and you've got this you know 
kid essentially from Brazil with this, you know, stunning black and gold liveried car and he's just, you know, smashing around, setting pole position time. It's just, you know, what an era. They've got the statue uh, of Senna at Imola and we renamed the chicane mm. uh, at the end of the main straight on the Adelaide Street circuit after Senna. So it became the Senna chicane after he passed away in 1994. Do you think uh, we've obviously got the handprints near the Senna chicane in the ground? Um, do you think maybe a statue might be a good idea as well? It would be amazing. And, and I think, you know, if you think of Senna, aside from Imola and Monaco, probably you associate him most with Adelaide. You know, his last win was here, his 41st and final win in 93. And, you know, as you say, the, the chicane's named after him. And now that we know that motor racing is going to continue at that track and it's always going to be known as the Senna chicane, it would be nice to have something more concrete there. As we discussed on the last podcast, it is a shame that you go to Victoria Park and there is hardly anything that would, you know, you'd look at and go, well, that shows there was a Grand Prix here apart from the concrete in the ground. Um, it would be nice to have more of that. You know, even if it's just, you know, the handprints are great, but they're in the ground. So they're not sort of easily visible. You almost have to trip over it to see it. So it'd be nice if there was something that more elevated that you could see from a distance. But um, that's always been the focal point for sort of the Senna Memorial within Adelaide. That's where the, you know, the um, celebrations of his life occurred, you know, in the anniversary since. And, um, the same day as um, his funeral in Brazil, there was a sort of um, a mass at that point, and that's, I believe, that's when they did officially, you know, announce that they would rename the chicane in his honour. So, yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice to have those things at Victoria Park. Given, you know, as we've said, it's um, we need to sort of celebrate that history more. 1986, uh, Nigel Mansell had that huge tyre blowout um, on Decatur Terrace, so fastest part of the track. He may have been prepared to move over. And look at that! Out that, and colossally, that's Mansell! That is Nigel Mansell, and the car absolutely shattered. He's fighting for control, and you can see what's happened. Mansell is out of the race. Now, this could change and will change the World Championship. Massive accident. Quite impressive to see the uh, the tyre exploding, all sparks going everywhere, but it was also a, a three-way championship deciding race. Yeah, very rare in Formula 1's history that you have three drivers fighting for the championship. And you know, like we were saying last time, we only had two championship deciders of the 11 years, but if you're going to have two, you might as well have two of the best. And they definitely were, and they had both have this pivotal, iconic moment. And the 86, the tyre explosion, I mean, I, you know, if Adelaide got royalties for the amount of time that footage was shown, we could probably afford to get the Grand Prix back. But, um, you know, just an iconic bit of footage. And I think you, you're right. The, the thing that's underscored in all that is Mansell's ability to keep it in a straight line and go into the runoff area. People have speculated whether he went into the wall, whether whether they would have red flagged the race and awarded half points and he could have been a champion. But if you watch that race, there's a Minardi into the wall at, at you know, um, Banana Bend for the, most of the race that they just race around. So unlikely they would have stopped it. But um, yeah, heartbreak for Mansell. And I think po after Senna, he's probably the driver we associate most with Adelaide just because so much drama, so much excitement. And, you know, he, he raced, you know, he was at the very first one and it took him until 94, replacing Senna to win. Uh, and it was sort of this um, fitting end of that generation to have Mansell winning in Senna's old car. Just quickly on that, because we had uh, PK, Senna, Mansell, all of those guys were huge names in the sport. And it was, as it came to the end in 1995, almost like, them as the old guard were being changed over for the likes of of hill and schumacher and yeah um that, that's really 94 is the changing of the guard sadly with senna's passing sort of really emphasized that generation change and what you have is um this end of an era that coincides with the loss of the grand prix for adelaide and so you come to 94 with schumacher and hill you're going to crown a new champion and you know you've got these new names like barrichello and panis and frenson and all these guys who were sort of essentially rookies and but then the irony of at the end of the 94 race on the podium you have mansell brundle and berger who were three of that sort of the center 
generation and all three of those drivers had it linked to Senna which was pretty amazing and that was really that sort of final curtain call for that generation and beyond then you know you know you're right Prost had retired PK had retired um, Mansell you know retired halfway through 95 Senna tragically no longer with us and it's these all new names and Schumacher Hill and it really sort of put a real full stop on the end of the Adelaide era and then when you go to Melbourne it's even more further away because Schumacher moves to Ferrari so um, it's amazing how it happens it just sort of um, coincided tragically with Senna's death uh, 89 and 90 had the accidents between Prost and Senna in Japan obviously the, in 89 was that coming together in the chicane and then 90 uh, you had Senna just go basically in, <laughs> into turn one and, and kamikaze um, kamikaze prost into the gravel which looking back now comparing it to the sport of today you would never get away with that in this day and age would you no and, and that's the sad thing for Adelaide was we missed out on two potential championship deciders there because it was all you know the, the drama in Japan um, put it early end to the championships when they really deserved that last race decider um, yeah amazing when you look back uh, there was you know very little ramifications for those accidents um, um, obviously there was some you know political stuff that was going on at the time and the only for Adelaide was we would always get the fallout you know, we'd get the Senna Prost, the heated press conferences, and Prost isn't talking to Senna, and Senna isn't talking to Prost. Prost, you know, refused to do driver photos and things in 1990 as a protest. So um, we had this sort of end of season vibe, but, you know, there, there was still that tension of those championship deciders because they were so bitter. Even though the championship was decided, though, in Japan, everybody came to Adelaide and, you know, once again, huge party town in, in Europe. It's obviously coming into winter. Here in Australia, we're coming in, in, into summer um, and it's just beers, barbecues, beach and, you know, happy days. Yeah, and your know, drivers would coincide, you know, go on holiday in Queensland and, you know, Bali or, or wherever, you know, they'd stay and it, it was great for that. And, you know, I'd love to have been able to, like, calculate how many more, you know, how much more money got put into the South Australian economy by people who just came early and, and left late. And, um, you know, that's the benefit of having that final race of the season. You could have that sort of party vibe. And, you know, yes, we didn't have those championship deciders, but we still had a lot going on. And it was sort of... Um, it meant that, you know, the races probably some of them lacked that tension but they were more fun in a way because you could you had drivers who really had a go um you know a classic example was Gerhard Berger in 88 in the Ferrari he just went hell for leather at the start knowing he probably wouldn't finish or beat the McLarens because they were so dominant but he just went for it because why not there's nothing on the line so um it, it was a cool feature for a Grand Prix that you know like Adelaide to have just taking a little side shoot off to another event that's going to be happening at the end of the year the Adelaide 500 that's being changed from a March event to an end of year event do you reckon we'll see some similar offshoots as far as Adelaide being at the end of the supercar calendar yeah absolutely I, I think that's great because it, it does marry up well with the Grand Prix and it has that similar vibe and you know already from what I understand supercars will hold their end of season gala here in Adelaide for example so that's already an extra night of hotel stays and you know um the drivers and their partners, you know, spending money in Adelaide's, you know, fashion stores or whatever, um, restaurants and things. And um, not only does it take it away from the Mad March fringe side of things, which became a bit of a problematic sort of um, clash, um, it just gives it that, you know, end of year vibe. You come in at Christmas, summer's starting. It's, it's a perfect fit. And, and you can then correlate the histories you know you can talk about the championship deciders like we've just done if there is a supercar championship on the line you know um so the the more that we can bring back that Grand Prix history and and fit it into the Adelaide 500 narrative the better it's not a bad place to live is it old Adelaide seeing that we're so close to the city a um, little bit overcast today but it's a great place for a street circuit and that's what that's the fundamental success of the Adelaide 500, Adelaide Grand Prix, uh, is that you have this parklands next to the city, so you could do a street circuit, but you could have this space to you know house the 
the paddocks and the concerts and the merchandise and the food stalls and all that, most street circuits struggle to have that. And we're very blessed, and that goes back to, you know, William Light's, you know, foundation of Adelaide building a parkland around a city. And, and it's... um. It's, it's why it works. It just, you know, it's right in the heart of the city and but you've got the space to make it all fit and, and enjoy. And, and that's, I think, if you look at Melbourne compared to Adelaide, that, you know, those few kilometres outside the city make a big difference. Whereas here, you walk out of the gate and you're on Rundle Street with, with all the parties and, you know, um, stuff. And that just, that's what makes it. Coming back to F1, in 1991, we had a wet race on a scale of wet to wet. How wet was it? Uh, very, very wet. Um, that would never run today, not not in a million years. And it, it's amazing they attempted to start it. Um, obviously, a lot of political, economic reasons. Um, fun fact, that was the first race to, to go live into China. Okay. Australia 91 hence you know probably one of the reasons why there was pressure to actually make it happen yeah, yeah. Um, so I- incredible to think that it they started it two years earlier in 89 it was very wet and it lasted the full two hours but it was carnage it was a race of survival so the fact that they had that experience from 89 I think dictated 91 where they just thought no we, we need to cancel us and you know again real shame that you know two of the three years were rain affected and when you look back at the history of the event and, and how we lost it, it was really bad timing because 91 was the height of the state bank collapse and, you know, um, stuff was really going wrong with the local economy. So to have that shortened race and just the loss of ticket sales that come with a with a race, rain-affected event like that, um, just very bad timing. You said that there was no way that it would be run today. One of the interesting things that I've found is with all of the standing water there was no safety car start or rolling start it was started under under green lights it's pretty pretty amazing to to think yeah exactly and you know being a street circuit concrete lined so you know if a car crashes there's not much they can do with it so you you re-watch the race and down brabham straight to kettle terrace is just cars littered on the side of, of the track you know pretty we're pretty fortunate you know we had some lucky escapes obviously mick hackner 95 the most obvious one but um it could have been a lot worse because you had that amazing footage of, of Senna going around and he's got I think he had both hands out the uh, car at one point he's waving his arms around basically telling the officials to stop the race Senna's waving now Senna waving to the clock to the uh, st- people on the start finish line and Senna is now getting very agitated indeed stop the race stop the race he's saying red flag is out red flag out red flag on the start finish line so the race has been stopped yeah, exactly. I mean, and he was the rain master, so for him to say that, it had to be bad. And and, um, and that was his first win in Adelaide. You know, he, he had been here since the start, but hadn't managed to win it. And it was a shame that his first win here was, you know, a shortened half-point race. But um, it was sort of... It was a perfect way for him to end his third world championship. Um, he met El McPherson here that year, who was in the celebrity race, and, and they... Um, you know the rumours that you know are that they sort of had a bit of a fling. So you know, um, yeah, what a what a time for him. <laughs> you mentioned the celebrity race, but just quickly, that that's one of the things that made the the whole Adelaide Grand Prix event event great. You had the celebrity race, you had the super carts, you had the touring cars. There was so much support racing. It was amazing. I mean, the minute by minute schedule is just jam packed, and and there's always something going on and credits Adelaide you know that's it really took F1 events to that next level you know if you went to F1 events in Europe for example it was you know three hour gaps in between sessions and and you know watching Marshall sweep the track in between you know Adelaide was just it was everything on and off the track and you know that's not even to mention the concerts and the street parties and the the fashion shows and, and everything that was going on with it and um that just grew year by year you know if you look at the program for the first one in 85 there was you know touring cars and super carts and stuff like that but by the end you're talking seven or eight support categories and um it really stemmed from this idea that you know from the very beginning they weren't sure if it was going to be a success so they threw everything out at concerts and, and the like and it just grew from there and it, it was such value for money if you're a spectator because you just got four days of jam-packed action 
1991, uh, Senna's rival Prost was fired by Ferrari. Probably one of the things you don't do when driving for Ferrari is say that the car handles like a truck. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a real ugly divorce and a shame. And he was actually already in Australia. He was on, on holiday in Queensland when he got the call that he wasn't his services weren't required in Adelaide. And um, it's it's it was a shame. And um, you know, we there's that famous image of the Ferrari mechanic sort of pulling his name off the pit garage and um it's uh yeah prost is another one who was you know right at the heart of the Adelaide grand prix from the very beginning and it was his first championship year 85 was our first year on the calendar and um you know he was always involved in that drama with senna and you know um yeah pretty amazing to think that you know it what promised so much his move to ferrari ended like that the race was stopped and abandoned after 16 laps and that was the shortest race in F1 history up until last year, was it? Yeah, until Belgium, which, you know, really shouldn't have been called a race considering it was all behind a safety car. So I think Adelaide, it, it's sad we lost that record, although it wasn't a good record to have, but it was still a record and it was always nice to be, you know, in that discussion when you talk about F1 history. But yeah, pretty amazing it happened. Um, a shame because, you know, we wanted that success and we wanted the events to work and when you had the rain and you know shortened event and then you know the opponents could you know use that against it and it was a it was at the time it was becoming a bit of a political you know game and um but yeah just adelaide's capable of some crazy weather at times and just you know two two or three years it just got really unlucky 1993 was Senna's final win. It was leaving McLaren to go to Williams. Final win in Adelaide. Yeah, um, pretty amazing as well to think that, you know, we didn't know it at the time, but obviously that was going to be his last trip here. And um, it was a, a great way to end his time with McLaren. And there's that, you know, famous footage of him on at the concert with Tina Turner on stage and, and all that. And... Um, you know, obviously we didn't think at the time would be his final Grand Prix win and, and to think it wasn't, you know, the last time he was on a podium, the last time Prost was on a podium, it was this real end of an era and um, again, uh, amazing to think it all happened here and I think then the tragic events of 94 just made it even more significant. Is it a, a replica of his trophy or is it his actual trophy that's is it at the State Library? I believe it's a replica because I believe the real one's in McLaren. Okay. So I think McLaren could keep their driver's trophies. And I believe when Daniel Ricciardo won in Monza in 21, he put his trophy next to Senna's from 93. I think he was at that race. Although he claims he was at that race, but the photo I have seen of him there suggests to me it's 94. Okay. So his memory might be a bit off, but... Um, he may have been here. They may have been, uh, made a few more trips from Perth. But, um, yeah, it's it it great. It's also the last um, event sponsored by Fosters. So it's the last of that trophy. And then there was a new trophy for 94, 95. So, again, um, 93, we didn't even know at the time we were about to lose the Grand Prix. So the announcement comes through that Melbourne has stolen, let's use that word in quotation marks, the Grand Prix from from us that announcement comes through in December 93 so the Grand Prix happens in November 93 so all these things we just didn't know at the time you know that that was the last time we'd see Senna and Prost last race and you know that you know the Grand Prix was going to be taken it just all these things happened and we just had no idea is that trophy on display at the um, state library can anybody go in there and have a look uh, it uh, it appears uh, every now and again on display. There's a few trophies they have from 85 and some of the other years they have within their collection go, it goes on and off display, but um, it is great when they're there and um, it's, you know, they've become the custodians basically when the Grand Prix office in Adelaide closed. The stuff that was deemed, you know, not really needed or not really historically significant was sold in an auction in Victoria Park at the start of 96 and the rest was given to the State Library thankfully because then at least there's something that belongs to the people of Adelaide. 1994 the seven time world champion eventually Michael Schumacher went into the side of Damon Hill. And uh, that looks Schumacher's off Schumacher's lost time. Yeah. Hill goes by. 
Oh, out, out goes Schumacher. The German is out of the Australian Grand Prix and Damon Hill only has to keep going to be world champion of 1994. But can he keep going? Because he hit Schumacher's car. And if Damon Hill has to retire and you see smoke pouring off the wheel, that will mean that Schumacher will be world champion. What an incredible development. Yeah, like Mansell Tobler, right? that's an iconic image that's shown every time there's a championship decider is, you know, what happens when the championship just, you know, challenges collide. And, um, yeah, pretty amazing, the, the whole circumstance around it. Schumacher goes into the wall. He's parked up. He doesn't know what's happened to Hill. Hill continues back to the pits. His suspension's too damaged, so he retires. And uh, that footage where, you know, the marshals are telling Schumacher that he's world champion and... Um, Again, it's incredible to think that just happens in Adelaide on a street that people drive past thousands of times. And um, then, you know, that's the start of the Schumacher era, you know, seven championships. And um, it begins in Adelaide. And that's, you know, as well as his first championship, it's also his first real flashpoint of, you know, some controversy. You know, his career was littered by controversy controversies. It wasn't the first time he collided with a rival in a championship decider. There was Villeneuve in ninety seven. So um again the significance of it happening here is um great for us, you know, great for our history that, that happened here. Eighty nine and ninety obviously had Senna and Pross, you know, smashing out in that championship decider and I remember seeing an interview it was, it was after um a long time actually after the little crash, let's uh, call it that, between himself and Hill and, and Schumacher said, you know, back in those days there was still a little bit of grey area on, on whether whether that was, was allowed. I don't think you could get away with that in 2022. No, diff- totally different driving standards nowadays and officiating and, and back then, you know, you uh, hardly saw time penalties within races. It was only ever if, you know, there was a blatant pit lane speeding or something along those lines. So, there was those sort of shades of grey, if you like, within the races, and, and that's what made 94 so amazing was that you had this sort of, you know, did he do it on purpose? Did he not really know? Um, you know, there's all these theories that um, Hill, you know, might not have seen the damage to Schumacher's car, so should he have waited? Or, you know, um, did Schumacher know his car was, you know, wounded and he had to do something in that moment? Um, all these things, and... You know, what an incredible flashpoint. And it all just stems from, you know, Schumacher, the corner previous, just making that slight misjudgment going into the wall. And, um, you know, because until then it was it was neck and neck. They were really shadowing each other all race. But it felt like, you know, Schumacher needed to make a mistake for Hill to get the advantage. So, you know, what could have been... Um, like with Mansell, um, he'll, you know, eventually gets his championship. So I think maybe, you know, the feeling wouldn't be as bad as for both drivers having lost championships so, you know, um, controversially or sort of, you know, heartbreakingly in Adelaide, they do get their championships in the end. And, um, but, you know, for Schumacher, that was really the beginning of, you know, he just became, went to a different level. In, in 95, he won it well before Adelaide and, and you know two championships with Benetton then he goes to Ferrari and he does what he did there just um incredible driver who you know we were lucky we got the you know we from the start his whole Benetton time essentially was here in Adelaide and 1995 was a pretty big year it was our our final Grand Prix for Adelaide before it went to Melbourne Hakkinen had his huge crash on a Friday I think huge is probably a an understatement he was coming down Rundle Road and got a puncher before turning right onto Decatur Terrace, jumped over the kerb and, and went into the, the tyre barrier. Just to see that onboard footage of his neck, I mean, there were no build-up side pods. That was one of the things that came out of the accident. Rule changes there. No hands device. He was he was very lucky. Very, and the fact there was doctors there, you know, who could perform immediate, you know, procedures to get him breathing and um, essentially he was choking on his own blood. So they needed to do something, you know, time was critical at that point. And, um, you know, that would have just been, you know, an immense tragedy to, to have that happen. Um, but credit to everyone involved, they, they saved his life. There's no two ways about it. And obviously he, you know, he had, 
you know, a bit of a long haul recovery and he stayed in Adelaide for, for weeks after, to, you know, at the Royal Adelaide Hospital sort of getting treatment before he could fly back to Europe. But again, we look back, he's a double world champion, you know, he, he fought back, went from strength to strength and, you know, that the mental toughness of surviving that accident surely holds you in good stead when you're fighting for championships and, um, you know, amazing that he survived, credit to everyone involved. You know, also just, you know, the nature of a street circuit, he was only a few minutes down the road from the Royal Adelaide Hospital at the time. So, um, great thing that he survived and he's still with us. And that's the thing, the Royal Adelaide Hospital wasn't down North Terrace past the railway station. It was literally across the road, wasn't it? Absolutely, it was right there. And, you know, not just the fact that there was Marshall stationed on that corner um, to the point where the Formula One's doctor, Professor Sid Watkins, he admits he didn't have to do anything because they handled the situation as well as he could. So he sort of essentially sat back and let them do their thing and um, and then they could get him to hospital and they could begin the recovery to the point where even within the weekend they you know everyone could see that he was going to get better because um, you know the initial fears were you know he could have been lost to us but um, by the end of the weekend it seemed like he would be okay and um, yeah it's he I believe he stayed in Adelaide till you know the end of the year into the new year and then you know fought back and then a few years later he's a world champion and um, again one of those drivers we can look back on and say that you know he raced here and you know um, went on to bigger and better things I did mention that they obviously brought the rule changes with, with the built up side pods these days we've obviously got the halo uh, hands device I think that came in in 2003 um, but the thing I like about the Adelaide Grand Prix days is and the thing it's like with any sport, you want to be watching something on TV that either you can't do or you wouldn't do. And when you see the cars going around these days, they're so like cocooned in this little safety cell that, you know, I'm sure I couldn't set lap times like, like the best of them. But it, not that it almost seems too safe, but if you do have an accident, there's not really much chance that you are going to be going off off to hospital whereas you know back in the Adelaide Grand Prix days it's open cockpits the shoulders are out of the car the head's all exposed and 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 you watch it on TV and you think you know what like these guys are serious serious gladiators absolutely and when you look back at that era Adelaide was considered one of the safer street circuits because it had that space that a normal street circuit didn't have it was wider um, there was sort of you know the, the wall wasn't right there on most of the track but then you ha see an accident like Hackenens and you realise that well there's pretty big consequences for you know punches or making mistakes or things like that so it was um, it was considered safe at the time but it probably wasn't and you're right I mean the, the risks were there for all to see how forward the drivers are how exposed their heads are um, you know th there wasn't even a pit lane limiter for, for most of the late era so you look back at those times and you, you do look back in amazement and think that there weren't more accidents like that and you know very fortunately there, there were no fatalities within the Grand Prix era obviously there was in the Adelaide 500 era but um, we we always had a good record when it came to safety and things like that and Hackett's accident proved it you know when with a test like that everyone sort of you know came up trumps and it was just um, you know um, he received the best medical care and um, could come back we recently had the Grand Prix in Melbourne and there was a lot of stuff over Facebook about it being the largest Grand Prix crowd in the Australian Grand Prix history and I don't know, I did, has Melbourne forgot that Adelaide actually had a Grand Prix? Y yes, in a sense it has and I, I, it's not just them, sadly. It, it seems like it's a lot of people and this is where... Um, I got into a bit of a trouble because I, I did an interview with the ABC around the Australian Grand Prix and I spoke about the forgotten legacy of Adelaide and then that happened with the crowd and I go, well, that sort of proves my point in that it's easy for people to forget Adelaide when we're not really doing a great enough job to go to tell our history. And you're right, the fact that we have the biggest crowd in the history of the Australian Grand Prix, but then when Melbourne can claim, well, no, we have it, everyone can run with it because no one's going well no calling you out here's the facts so um 
credits to Melbourne, you know, it was the, the biggest um, crowd for Melbourne for them, but it didn't reach the heights of 95. And that's at the end of the day, the Adelaide Grand Prix was still the Australian Formula One Grand Prix. It's just, it moved cities, but it's still the same event. So it should be a shared history. It should be, you know, um, the tally should be, you know, married together and and it shouldn't be treated like separate things which it can feel like I think two things with that one is like I said no one's really championing and remembering the Adelaide side of things but two if the political ramifications of the move meant that Melbourne really tried to differentiate itself from Adelaide all credit to them for doing that but you, you sort of have to remember where it all started you know if Adelaide didn't get the Grand Prix from 85 you know how many more years would it have taken for Australia to get the Grand Prix so it, it, the histories need to be told and that's where you know someone had to come up and say no Adelaide had the record. Uh, just to put a bit of meat on the bone, so uh, Melbourne on race day had 128,000. I think there was some talk that 25,000 people couldn't get tickets because of because of restrictions uh, in in place. But um, 128,000 for Melbourne on race day. Uh, 1995, Adelaide had 210,000 on race day, and uh, overall crowd over the four days of 520,000 people. We're not a Melbourne and we're not a Sydney and we don't want to be a Melbourne or a Sydney. For Adelaide being such a small town, that's pretty impressive. Incredible to think. And, you know, when you look back at photos of that event and the race itself, you can literally see how people jam paint. There's grandstands where there were no grandstands before and there really was a feeling from the Grand Prix office that this is it, so let's just throw everything at it. This was the grand finale, so let's just, you know, just let's do it let's do it properly you know to have a you know Bon Jovi concert on the Sunday night you know obviously that's gonna you know get more people through the gates but again that was an Adelaide thing where you'd have concerts you know and you'd get people in who aren't necessarily Formula 1 fans and credit to them because you know they did it if you, if you look at that 95 event it's just from the minute you know from a week before those events there was a a fan day at the track to you know with a big screen showing the Japanese Grand Prix you know a few weeks earlier like just stuff like that there was I think there was a feeling at the time that you know Adelaide might sort of back off the throttle and just sort of let it peter out but the fact that it sort of went even the other way and it was a credit to everyone involved it, it um it almost wanted to prove a point to Formula 1 I think of you know this is what you're losing at the end of the day and um you know I mean there's crowds incredible concerts support categories the race was you know it wasn't a classic it was a race of attrition but still you know um it was a great spectacle and um you know a great way to go out 95 only had eight cars finishing and i think all of it bar one part is available to watch on youtube so if you do get the opportunity i think it's, it's made up of 10 parts have, have a watch of the 1995 adelaide grand prix because because it's a really great race and just so many people you know breaking down crashing uh you had coulthard he was he, he was leading the grand prix wasn't he and then he came into the pits and i think there was a bit of dust on the pit entry and and he crashed in into the wall and into the pit lane oh my goodness david coulthard smashes himself out of the australia i have never seen that before he comes into the pit lane and into the wall and blows his chance of winning for Williams. What an absolute disaster for him. Yeah, another one of those iconic images that gets replayed so often. And it, it was, you know, a crazy race. You had Schumacher crashing with a Lacey and then they would swap cars for the following season. Um, and they had a bit of a um, tiff in the pit lane after, which is ironic because they were really good friends off track. And um, just, yeah, it was a race of attrition and Hill wins by two laps and... Um, Panis finishes in second with his engine, you know, stuttering and, you know, oil spraying everywhere. And um, it, it was, a, again, just a, a fitting way to go out, sort of the craziness of that era, you know, um, the fact that you had all that. And you look at Formula 1 now, the cars are pretty bulletproof, whereas unreliability was a big factor back then. And I, I think that almost made the racing more exciting because you just did not know what could happen. You know, at any stage, the leader could just blow up. And then, you know, it, it's on and then you have these weird drivers on the podium or in the points and um, 
yeah, not the best Adelaide Grand Prix, but um, a great way to end when you combine everything else that was around that weekend. Yeah. Remember um, when there's only a few laps to go and Olivier Panis starts getting the problem with his uh, Mugen Honda engine and uh, Murray Walker just changed gear, he just went from a just slow, calm talking to, like the saying goes, his, his pants absolutely on fire and you had, I think it was Jonathan Palmer, uh, Murray Walker, obviously in the early days you had James Hunt. Do you think they played... Uh, the like the commentators of especially you know Murray Walker and James Hunt do you think they played a big role as far as getting the spectator involvement and people actually interested in Formula One? Yeah, absolutely. Again, we spoke about the golden era of Formula One. They were a big part of that. James Hunt and Murray Walker, and they were at the forefront. And it was great for us that they loved Adelaide. They loved Australia. They loved coming here. They loved talking about it. And um, it was great in the sense that. You know, Murray never let us go. Like, he would come back for the Adelaide 500 and commentate, and he would always... I interviewed him at an Adelaide 500, and the way he spoke about the Grand Prix, you could just see his eyes light up. And the Adelaide 500 reminded him of that, and it gave him that sort of feeling of what it was like. So, you know, great years. And just, again, they were... You know, James Hunt sadly passed away in 93, but um, Murray was there throughout and he really was the soundtrack of that and you can hear him commentating Mansell's tyre blowout and the Schumacher Hill collision and things and um, again we were, you know, I don't know if it's good luck, karma, whatever, but we were blessed in that sense that so many good things about Formula 1 were around at that time and then you go sort of a bit fur, you know, it goes to Melbourne and you move further away from it and they sort of, you know, slowly disappear. You know, the Senna's passing. Um, Schumacher going to Ferrari leads to this dominant period where it's not very competitive, you know. Um, they change the engines and they become less, you know. Um, Adelaide's the last race for a V12 engine in Formula 1, Adelaide 95. So Melbourne never got to hear the Ferrari V12. Just little things like that. Um, think, well, we, the stars really aligned. I don't know if I'm a religious or karma person or whatever, but you almost think we didn't have it for long. There's only 11 Grand Prix, but we had 11 pretty amazing years that all these things happened and all these great attributes of Formula 1 were around. Um, so is it better to have just 11 and all those great things or have, you know, 22 and more and not those things? So I guess that's up to the eye of the beholder. So I'm sure when you ask the average punter on the street what happened to the Adelaide Grand Prix, they'll say that it was stolen by Melbourne. But is it as simple as that or was there more to it? No, there's definitely more to it. There's no doubt Melbourne came in and took advantage of what was going on in South Australia. And, you know, they didn't do anything illegal in that sense. They did what any rival city would do is see an opportunity, see a great event and go, well, we could use that you know, and transplants over there and have those positive effects. In essence, South Australia left itself in a position where it could be stolen and it could be lost. And it, you just, uh, the misfortune for Adelaide was that you had a state next door that was, you know, ready to do that. And it had the, the government and commercial support that, you know, Adelaide had, you know, in the mid to early 80s. Um, and they saw an opportunity and they went for it. So... It was a bit of both. There was, you know, a lot of factors, but it really begins and ends with the economic situation in South Australia with the collapse of the state bank, which made it prohibitive and, you know, put into question whether the Grand Prix was a viable long-term option for Adelaide. Yeah. I know I said that we're going to discuss it in this podcast, but it sounds like there is a lot more to it, and I think uh, we might need to do do part three and cover it off then. How does that sound? Yeah, it, it's very complicated, you know, more so because a lot of it doesn't actually involve the Grand Prix. It's all this other stuff, you know, um, the state bank collapse, SGIC crisis, the Maya Centre being built and the cost involved in that, you know, what's going on in Melbourne with um, Keating, uh, you know, the Keating is um, Prime Minister and, you know, um, Kennett in Melbourne. It's just all these other factors just, you know, taking aside what's going on with South Australian politics. So um, it's a complicated thing, but, you know, at the end of the day, as fortunate as Adelaide was to get it in the first place, it was very unlucky in the circumstances that led 
to its loss and that goes back you know 87 this you know the market crashes the recessions of the early 90s and you know we discussed earlier the washouts of 89 and 91 in 89 there was a pilot strike so you know people couldn't get to the event from interstate as they would have in other years just all these factors roll roll together and just mean that it was right for the picking from someone else well there we go part three how we lost the grand prix adrian again i appreciate your time thank you well there we have it the end of part two looking back on a few of those memorable moments from the adelaide grand prix was there a memorable moment that we forgot feel free to leave a comment on the facebook page or the youtube channel you can find them both look up relive adelaide how we lost the grand prix will be part three I look forward to joining you then. Bye for now.